Hello, today I'm going to do a reading from uh, Richard III in Fact and Fiction that I wrote for Pen and Sword Books. It's designed to give little bite-sized chunks of information to try and deal with some of the more controversial aspects of Richard's life. This is taken from Chapter 4, which deals with the Crisis of 1483. Did Richard and the Woodville family really hate each other? There's a perception that Richard, as Duke of Gloucester, hated his sister-in-law Elizabeth Woodville and all of her family. It's frequently argued that this animosity was the cause of Richard's arrest of Anthony Woodville, Earl Rivers, in 1483, and his opposition to the Dowager Queen on his arrival in London, ultimately culminating in his seizure of the throne. Is there really evidence of a long-running feud between the King's brother and his wife's family? Much of the weight for the idea of a feud comes from Dominic Mancini, an Italian visitor to London during the spring of 1483. As an eyewitness, his testimony is given a great deal of weight, but there are significant problems with this source, not least the current translation from the Latin that is widely used. Mancini spoke no English and demonstrates a lack of understanding of English politics so that some of the wider information he provides is not accurate. Nevertheless, Mancini explains that Richard's hatred of the Queen's family stemmed from the execution of his older brother, George, Duke of Clarence, in 1478. Mancini notes that Elizabeth Woodville became terrified of George and concluded that her offspring by the King would never come to the throne unless the Duke of Clarence were removed. This fear led to George's prosecution and execution for treason, as a direct result of which Mancini suggests Richard, Duke of Gloucester, was so overcome with grief for his brother that he could not dissimulate so well but that he was overheard to say that he would one day avenge his brother's death. This sets up a bitter rivalry that would be played out in London in 1483, but is there any real evidence for what Mancini alleges? The Woodville family had risen quickly, firstly with Elizabeth's father's marriage to the widowed Jacquetta, Duchess of Bedford, and then with her own union to Edward IV. Elizabeth's father, Richard Woodville, had been created Earl Rivers but had been killed along with one of his sons by the Earl of Warwick during the uprising in 1469. Elizabeth was the oldest of 13 children who survived to adulthood. Anthony was the second child and as the oldest son became Earl Rivers on his father's death. Although initially a Lancastrian family, the Woodvilles became firmly tied to the Yorkist cause with Elizabeth's marriage to the King. A feud between Edward IV's closest friend, Lord Hastings, and at least some of the Woodville family particularly Elizabeth Woodville's oldest son from her first marriage, Thomas Gray, Marquis of Dorset, is well attested to. It apparently lay behind some of the events in the aftermath of Edward's death, but there's remarkably little to suggest that such tension existed with Richard. There is no evidence that Richard hated his sister-in-law, though his mother, Cecily Neville, Duchess of York, appears to have taken umbrage at the low match her oldest son had made for himself. It's therefore possible that either Richard possessed some of the same prejudices or that his mother's opinion swayed his own. Yet Richard maintained a good enough relationship with his brother to suggest that there was nothing as strong as hatred. Anthony Woodville and Richard, Duke of Gloucester, were very similar characters in many ways. Anthony was known as a soldier and a scholar. He had his own translation of the dicts and sayings of the philosophers printed by William Caxton in 1477, making him an early patron of the printing press that was about to revolutionise Europe. Richard was also interested in this new technology and owned an extensive library. Both men enjoyed a solid reputation as soldiers, Anthony also becoming the most famed Englishman at tournaments, a pursuit Richard does not appear to have participated in. Just as Richard was placed in charge of the northern regions of Edward's kingdom, Anthony was given control of the young Prince of Wales and his household, allowing him to exercise a great deal of authority in Wales. Richard would arrest Anthony on their way to London and send him north, where he would later be executed. When Anthony sat to write his final will and testament on the 23rd of June 1483, it's perhaps telling that he appointed several men close to Richard as executors. He also wrote, Over this I beseech humbly my Lord of Gloucester, in the worship of Christ's passion and for the merit and weal of his soul, to comfort, help and assist as supervisor for very trust of this testament, that my executors may, with all his pleasure, fulfil this my last will. Anthony chose to appoint Richard as supervisor of his executors, which at least suggests a degree of trust. 
It's hard to tell whether Antony was merely recognising that Richard was now in power, or whether it was something of an admission of guilt in the accusation of a Woodville plot against Richard. It's hard to establish the true nature of the relationship between Richard and his sister-in-law's family. There's no real evidence beyond anecdotal opinions, like that of the poorly briefed Mancini, that they despised each other. Richard and Anthony Woodville had similar high reputations and rarely had cause to operate in the same political spheres in a way that might breed vendettas. There's no evidence that Richard disliked Edward's wife, either, beyond the possibility of sharing his mother's opinion, of which there's no evidence. After Easter 1484, Elizabeth came to terms with Richard as king and allowed her daughters to enter their uncle's protection, suggesting again that there was no long-term hatred between the two. It remains impossible to prove whether the two sides really hated each other, but neither is there any evidence of a running feud. Trying to see problems in the relationship between Richard and the Woodvilles is perhaps the application of hindsight. When Anthony Woodville went to Northampton to meet Richard, he appears to have done so in good faith, something that doesn't seem to have changed as he wrote his will after Richard had arrested him. Little known fact. Anthony Woodville was one of the most famous tournament knights in Europe, something that distinguishes him from Richard. As far as we know, there's no record of Richard ever taking part in a joust or a tournament, perhaps because of the problems caused by his scoliosis. Anthony took part in a huge and famous match with the Bastard of Burgundy, an illegitimate son of the Duke of Burgundy, in 1466. Did Richard kidnap Edward V at Stony Stratford? King Edward IV died on the 9th of April 1483 at Westminster. He was 19 days short of his 41st birthday and had been king for 22 years, with the exception of about six months during the Ariadeption. Vigorous and athletic in his youth, Edward had put on weight and spent his time in pleasure during the later years. He holds an impressive record of never having lost a battle in his life, no mean feat during the Wars of the Roses. Edward reportedly picked up a chill while fishing and after a brief illness he died and the unexpected nature of his removal from the political scene created huge problems. The first issue was that Edward's son and heir, now proclaimed King Edward V, was only 12 years old and was at Ludlow still undergoing the training his father had designed to prepare him to become king. Such a young king was always problematical as they were, they were not deemed able to rule in their own right leading almost inevitably to power struggles, the potential for abuse of that power, and a failure to adequately prepare the boy for government. Richard II had come to the throne in 1377 at the age of 10 and been deposed in 1399 after descending into tyranny. Even more recently, Henry VI had become king in 1422, aged just nine months, been unseated in 1461, and his rule had been disastrous for England. The country was likely to be made nervous by the accession of a minor, particularly so close to the dynastic struggles that had disrupted the nation. A second problem existed that was to influence the events that followed. Edward IV had a personality to match his frame and everyone liked him. Effusive commentators noted that he made even the most common man feel at ease in his presence and that he could recall the names of everyone he'd ever met should he see them again. For years, Edward had been the glue that kept the members of his court together around him at the centre. He was able to restrain factional fighting in a way that Henry VI had fatally failed to do, and an impending minority caused the lid to blow off these rivalries. The most significant dispute in London was between the Woodville family of Edward's wife, the Dowager Queen Elizabeth, and William Lord Hastings, Edward's closest friend. In particular, Hastings and Thomas Grey, Edward IV's stepson, maintained a deep rivalry and hatred of each other. Richard had spent most of the last decade or so in the north of England, away from the power politics of London. It's believed that Elizabeth Woodville didn't write to advise Richard of his brother's death. Instead, Lord Hastings sent word, urging Richard to come south quickly because the Woodvilles were planning to snatch power and exclude Richard, who had been appointed Lord Protector in a codicil added to Edward's will shortly before his death. There's no record of the communications that took place, but this version of events seems to have become accepted. If it's true, it makes it essential to understand that Richard left the North already wary of plots and threats that he might encounter when he reached London. The late addition to Edward's will also strongly suggests that he was aware of what might happen after he died and saw Richard as the perfect foil to the feuding. 
It's believed, though again there's no surviving evidence to prove the arrangement, that Richard organised with Anthony Woodville, Earl Rivers, who was the head of Edward V's household at Ludlow, and who was responsible for his education and upbringing, to meet at Northampton and to travel on to London together. The new king left Ludlow on the 24th of April. Anthony Woodville, having waited to celebrate St George's Day on the 23rd of April, before departing. Edward's coronation was being arranged for just 10 days later on the 4th of May, and it's believed that Richard was to meet the new king's party at Northampton on the 29th of April. Edward V's party arrived in Northampton first, but travelled on some 15 miles to Stony Stratford, just past the Woodville Manor of Grafton Regis and in their heartlands. Anthony Woodville remained behind to meet Richard at Northampton. When his party arrived from the north, it would not be unreasonable for Richard to have been put further on edge by the news that Edward was no longer in Northampton and had travelled onwards. Precisely what happened that night is unknown, but in the morning, Richard moved swiftly to arrest Anthony Woodville and ride to Stony Stratford, where he also sees Thomas Vaughan, Edward's Chamberlain, and Sir Richard Grey, the new king's stepbrother, younger brother to Thomas Grey. Richard had these men sent north and took Edward into his own custody before continuing slowly to London, arriving on the 4th of May, the date tentatively set for the coronation. The incident at Stony Stratford and the arrest of key figures around Edward V are traditionally seen as a ruthless signal of Richard's intention to seize the throne. Tudor historian Polydor Virgil pinpoints the night spent at Northampton as the moment that Richard tells his ally, Henry Stafford, Duke of Buckingham, that he's planning to take the throne. It's certain that the removal of those who had been closest to the young boy as he grew up must have been unsettling for the new king amidst all the other upheavals. He would barely have known his uncle Richard, particularly compared to his uncle Anthony. Nevertheless, it's perhaps not unreasonable that Richard acted out of caution. If Hastings had warned him of Woodville plotting, if Richard was aware of the factions breaking out in London, and if he saw his responsibility at that point as being to ensure his nephew's safe succession for the sake of his brother's memory and for the House of York more generally, then taking potential threats into custody is perhaps not unreasonable. As the King's paternal uncle and the senior adult male of the Royal House, Richard caused no real concern by taking control of the King. When they arrived in London, they were warmly welcomed and the Council would praise Richard's actions. That wasn't to be the end of the story though. Little known fact. Edward IV is the tallest monarch ever to rule England or Britain. He was six foot four, two inches taller than his grandson Henry VIII and an inch taller than Prince William, so he looks likely to hold the record for a while yet. Richard's skeleton shows that he would have stood at five foot eight inches tall, but the, for the curvature of his spine due to scoliosis that meant he, in fact, appeared several inches shorter. Richard definitely murdered Lord Hastings, didn't he? William Lord Hastings was a cornerstone of Edward IV's government. He'd been a close friend to the King from the beginning of his reign and had grown wealthy and powerful through the service he had given. During the months in exile, Hastings had joined Edward and Richard and after their return, he had continued to reap the rewards his loyalty brought. According to the traditional version of the muddled events of 1483, it was Hastings who informed Richard of his brother's death and warned him of a Woodville plot, advising him to hurry south. Just over a month after Richard arrived in London, he ordered Hastings' execution in an act viewed, even by those sympathetic to Richard, as unforgivable and inexplicable. Is this an indefensible act of murder? The position of Lord Protector is a peculiarly English, peculiarly 15th century creation. The codicil to Edward IV's will appointing Richard to this post has not survived, but he was confirmed in the office at a meeting of the council on the 10th of May, at least suggesting that it had been his brother's wish. The protector had responsibility for military matters, both domestic and foreign. The purpose of the role was to protect the kingdom during a minority or the incapacity of a king. It gave Richard no power in government or authority over the king's person, though the protector would usually be afforded a prominent place at council too. The office of Lord Protector and a position in the government though are not the positions that influence an understanding of the events of the council meeting of the 13th of June 1483. Richard had been Lord High Constable of England since October 1469. Except for the re period, 
Richard had held the office for almost 14 years, from the age of 17. When council met on the 13th of June, it did so in two locations. The majority met elsewhere, but Richard, Buckingham, Lord Hastings, Bishop Morton and Bishop Rotherham met at the Tower, nominally to conclude arrangements for Edward V's coronation. Thomas More's dramatisation has Richard enter the meeting, leave on a pretense and return crying treason. In the scuffle that follows, as guards burst into the room, Lord Hastings is arrested, dragged outside and beheaded. The key feature of the story is the cry of treason. The powers of the constable, as defined by Edward IV, permitted the trial of cases of treason based on evidence that the constable had seen. The constable had authority to act as judge, jury and executioner, and there was no right of appeal. It was a profoundly inequitable and unjust process, but deemed necessary in the dangerous, fast-moving politics of the Wars of the Roses. Richard had spent his entire adult life in possession of these powers and would have understood what they allowed him to do. Even later Tudor sources seem to allow that Lord Hastings was up to something. Polydor Virgil wrote that before Richard's arrival in London, Hastings called together unto St Paul's such friends as he knew to be right careful for the life, dignity and estate of Prince Edward and conferred with them what best was to be done. Grafton recorded that Lord Stanley sent to him, Hastings, a trusty and secret messenger at midnight in all haste, requiring him to rise and ride away with him. Even Thomas More stated that Richard was informed by a lawyer in Hastings' service, William Catesby, that Lord Hastings was conspiring against the Protector. More wrote that Catesby's account of the Lord Hastings' words and discourse, which he so represented to him as if he had wished and contrived his death, influenced Richard. No real evidence survives to help decide whether Hastings was genuinely plotting against Richard. It's possible that Hastings began to fear for Edward V's prospects, or that he was making his own bid for power, hoping to use Richard to defeat his Woodville enemies, and then his own understanding of and connections within London, to remove Richard and make himself the senior figure in government. Understanding this incident will always be coloured by a personal perspective of Richard and the events of that spring. Grafton later wrote that Richard showed his evidence to the Alderman of London immediately after the execution, and that they were satisfied that the Lord Hastings and other of his conspiracy had contrived to have suddenly destroyed him and the Duke of Buckingham there the same day in council. What Richard did on the 13th of June 1483 was effectively to convene a court of chivalry under the constable at which Lord Hastings was tried for treason based on evidence that Richard had seen, found guilty with no right of appeal and summarily executed. It's a process that doubtless sounds unpalatable to modern ears but was nevertheless a legal framework within which Richard was entitled to operate. The morality of this action remains open to question and will rest upon a personal belief either in Richard's fabrication of evidence to facilitate Hastings' downfall or in the genuine conviction that Hastings was conspiring against Richard as protector. Whether the evidence was real or not, the technical legality of his execution of Lord Hastings is not open to dispute. As Lord High Constable of England, Richard acted within powers that his brother had given him 14 years earlier. Lord Hastings was judicially executed, not murdered. The question is whether he used those powers to protect himself and his nephew from a perceived threat, or to eliminate opposition to a planned coup. Little known fact, the Lord High Constable was one of the nine great officers of state in medieval England, ranking seventh in the order of precedent below the Lord Great Chamberlain and above the Earl Marshal. These great offices form the basis of medieval government in England and several, including the Lord High Admiral, a position that Richard also held, and Lord High Chancellor, are still in use today. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed those little snippets and I'll be back with another reading soon.